Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. Today is November the 8th, 2020, and it's the morning we're going to celebrate our church's 43rd birthday. But before we get into that, I got a couple announcements and some updates to give you. Uh, first of all is next Sunday, November the 15th, is our re-entry day, our day that we're coming back inside the building. We've been meeting outside in the field. It's getting cold out there. So next Sunday, November 15th, we're coming back in the building. Here's some information you need to know. First of all, we're having two services, one at 9 a.m. and one at 11 a.m. Those services will be about an hour apiece. We want to test drive it. We want to make sure we can clean in between first service and second service. So we're just going to try some exploration and see how, we, how this thing works. First service at 9 a.m., masks are required. So if you want to come to a safer environment where everybody is wearing a mask and we have a big old sanctuary with a balcony, then Sunday morning, 9 a.m., that's for you. We're all wearing masks. At the 11 o'clock service, masks are optional. So if you feel a little safer, if you would like to come to that service, then masks are going to be optional. Also, our kids are having a coming back party this coming Sunday, but it's only at the 11 a.m. service. There are full nursery and children ministry at the 11 a.m. service. But if you bring your kids to the 9 a.m. service, it's a family service where the kids will be with their parents like we've been doing outside. So I hope that answers some of your questions, and I hope to see some of those faces we love to see, see back in person this coming Sunday, November 15th. Second of all, November the 22nd is our staff appreciation day, our pastoral staff. Uh, we're going to celebrate them. We're going to love on them. And so here's what's happening. This week, I sent you out an email with some of their favorite things. I'm going to ask you to consider doing three things for our staff. Pick one or more of them that have made a difference in your life, and you can, first of all, write them a card. Just They love words of affirmation. Write them a letter. Write them a card. They love opening those and reading those words of affirmation, especially in this year of 2020. Uh, they, they love and appreciate your affirmation. Number two, I sent you a list of their favorite things, favorite restaurants, uh, places to shop. If, you, if this, one of our staff has touched your life, maybe take some money and buy them a special gift, a gift card somewhere, and, and put that in the card. And number three, on November 22nd, we're going to take up a special love offering for our pastoral staff and split it and give it to them. So we're going to be celebrating Blake and Rebecca Stanberry, Herman and Amy Treboni, Chip Plemons, Jeannie Murray, and Emily Nagel. We're not celebrating me. You guys already celebrated me back in May. You guys take great care of my family. We want to make sure we celebrate our pastoral staff, so that's coming up on November 22nd. The third thing I want to mention is an update on me and on our church and my transition. Last week, I announced my resignation. God brought me an incredible op job opportunity working in the ministry for Asheville Buncombe Community Christian Ministries. And after three months of praying, uh, my team and I agreed that this is God's best for my life. I didn't see it coming, had no idea uh, a, a new assignment was coming my way. But when the commander in chief, God himself, sends you orders, you have to respond. So I made the announcement last week, and I want to give you an update. What, two things I'm going to do. Every week, I'm going to give you an update on where we are and what we're doing. And second of all, we're going to pray for our new senior pastor every week. We're going to go ahead. It's called prevenient praying. A prevenient prayer is when you pray for your daughter when she's too young to have a husband, and you start praying for that husband way in advance. You, you, you anticipate that one day he's coming, so you start praying way in advance. And so we're going to start praying for that new senior pastor. So this week, what we've done is we have finished the process of pulling together the job description, the different requirements. The, we have a three-part process. And the first part is the, our apostolic oversight team takes the job description and the requirements and then takes that out to the different networks of churches that we have relationship with so that we can look for other pastors out there already pastoring that might be interested in coming into this position and then setting up a personnel committee that can help receive all those applications. So all that's happening this week. And so I'm excited because the person we're looking for is special. We're looking for the best pastor that New Covenant's ever had. I hope he's better than Frank and I hope he's better than me. That's what we're hoping for. So I want to take just a second and I want to pray for that new pastor and ask God's blessing on them. Whether it's a he, a she, or a they, we want to bless them and we want to pray that God would knit their hearts with ours. So Papa, right now, even before we get into the sermon today, I want to pray for whoever you've called 
handpicked, predestined before the foundation of the earth to be the third senior pastor at New Covenant Church. And I'm asking you, Father, to, to cause their heart to stir and to dream and to want what this congregation is. And that, Lord, that you would put in their heart the desire to do life with this congregation and to fulfill the destiny and the vision that you have over this house. Father, we ask for your very best. We're not asking for somebody who's sitting at home right now, hoping he can find a job somewhere. We're looking for someone who's already doing great things for the kingdom, but would fall in love with this house, this community, these mountains, and want to spend time here. And so, Father, I'm asking right now that you give them godly wisdom, that they'd hear about the opportunity, their heart would leap with desire, and they would reach out. And, Lord, that we would recognize who they are, and that, Lord, this would be a positive transition, easy for the church, easy for the new senior pastor. And we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, I'm preaching the rest of the year. I'm preaching the rest of the sermons in November and December. Uh, we're gonna, we have a sermon series called Home for the Holidays. And, and it's not a, a strict sermon series, but more like some one-off sermons. Uh, some things about the holidays, the season. This really is a season to celebrate. We have so many good things going on from coming back into the building to having the elections over to uh, celebrating our staff, Thanksgiving, Christmas, wonderful things happening. And so uh, I want to talk to us today about a season to celebrate. And it being our 43rd birthday, I, I picked this, these, this passage because the Bible says there was three times, there was three times when uh, the Israelites were to come together for a festival and everybody had to attend. And it's all right here in this one passage. And I want to show you what God wanted them to celebrate. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about New Covenant's past and future and then I have a special prayer. I've never prayed this prayer before. It's a special prayer for you. I'm going to release something at the end of this sermon. So I hope you'll stick around for a few minutes. It won't be long, but it's something powerful that God brought to me this week that he wants to give to you. And I'm going to do it here in a few minutes. I'm going to be reading out of Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 17. Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 17. And let's look at the three feasts that all the Israelites were to come together and celebrate. And it says, observe the month of Aviv and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Aviv, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And you shall offer the Passover service to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat no leavened bread. In fact, the Passover feast was also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. He says, I want you to remember all the days of your life, that you remember that day that you came out of the land of Egypt. No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the eve in the evening of the first day remain all night until morning. You may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving to you, but at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell in it. There you, will, you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall cook it and eat at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days you will eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. So that's the first feast that the Lord says all the Israelites were to gather. Now we start the second feast. You shall count seven weeks, begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. So at the very beginning of the harvest, the very first sickle, that starts day one, count seven weeks, seven times seven, 49 days, then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. So he says there, you're going to count seven weeks, and at the end of the seven weeks, bring a free will offering of how the Lord has blessed you. 
So he's like, test me and see. I'm getting, I'll pour out my provision on you. But from the first sickle to the end of the harvest, bring according to the blessings that I've given you. I am a faithful God providing for you. And I want you to bring some of the first fruits of what I gave you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. So he, he's, everybody gets to be involved. The, nobody gets left out. In God's economy, the egalitarian substrate, God's economy, everybody gets taken care of. The 99 are provided for and the one is provided for. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. You shall, and then he goes on. Now this is the third feast, the Feast of Booths. Seven, you shall keep the Feast of Booths for seven days. And when you've gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press, you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you will keep the feast of, to the Lord, your God, at the place that the Lord you will choose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce, in all the works of your hand, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. When you come before the Lord... <clears throat> You should be bringing an offering. He has blessed you with something. Now he expects you to come back and testify to his blessing by offering some of what he's blessed you with back to him. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given to you. So every man is to give as he's able, but also according to the size of the blessing. That sounds like the tithe to me. It sounds like the Lord is saying, if I bless you a lot, I want you to give me a big blessing back. If I bless you a little, I understand you giving a little, but give in your heart as I have blessed you. So there's, there's three different feasts here that they talk about. And these three feasts, are, the first one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Passover. And if we could take a second to talk about that, first of all, you know, Three times a year, you had to show up at this mandatory feast. And I think one of the reasons that God did that is some years you were probably having a bad year. Some years you might have been having a good year. Some seasons are good. Some seasons are bad. But in every season, God is still worthy to be praised. And I think that God says, I know that some seasons will seem like a bad season, but I want you at, at specific times to celebrate me and my goodness and my faithfulness. I want to rise your faith up a little bit because I want you to focus on me and not focus on your circumstances. And so he set aside these three feasts. These feasts and celebrations are his idea. I don't know about you, but I tend to focus on the problems in my life more than the celebrations in my life. And for God to say, my people are going to need some time to celebrate. I'm going to set aside week-long celebrations for my people to gather together and to celebrate and have feast and have food and have fun. I want to make sure that we build some fun into my people. So wouldn't that be awesome to have a pastor that built fun into the church on a regular basis, no matter what's going on, 2020, pandemic, doesn't matter, fun in the church. So number one, celebrate the Passover. And the Passover represents our deliverance. So if you'll remember in Exodus, at the end of the nine plagues, then God warns Moses that there's a 10th plague coming. And it's the death of the firstborn. And so what's happening is the judgment is getting ready to come upon Egypt for all that Egypt has done to Israel. And so God comes to them and says, judgment is coming and every firstborn male is going to die, except I have made a provision for you. When you celebrate the Passover meal, this is what you'll do. You'll go get a, a lamb, one year old, whether it's a, a, a sheep or whether it's a goat, get a one year old lamb that is spotless without affliction, you are to kill that lamb and put some of the blood on the doorpost of your house so that the death angel, when he comes over, will not stop at your house. And so he said, then you're going to roast that lamb and pick a lamb that's, that's, that your family could eat in one whole meal. And if the lamb is too big for your small family, go, with, go to your nearest neighbor and have them come over because you are to eat every bit of it, leave no leftovers whatsoever. And if it's too much for your family, just invite your neighbors in. That's God's economy, by the way. He wants to bless you so that you have to 
include your neighbor into the celebration. And he said, now, when you eat this lamb, what you're supposed to do. Now, now think about this for a second, because when he said put the blood over the doorpost, to me, that's the most important part. The first, my firstborn son doesn't have to die because God has made provision. He's prophesying to Jesus. He's prophesying of the sacrificial lamb that's going to take away the sins of the world. But, but for me as a, as a Jewish man, if it served no other purpose than to put the blood over the doorpost so that judgment didn't come to my house, I, I could just be happy and stop right there. But it's not okay to God. God had a bigger plan than just saving us from our sin. He wanted them to then eat the meal. And the way they were to eat the meal was just, was really interesting. He said, I want you to eat the meal with your belt on. I want you to be ready to travel. Have your belt on, have your sandals on, and have your staff in your hand and eat it fast. Eat it with haste is what the Bible says. So, so God wanted them to gather together, be fully dressed, be ready to travel, have their sandals on, have their staff, eat their food fast as if they're getting ready to get out of here right now. And, and so even after that first night, that first Passover that happened in Egypt, that's how the Israelites were always to celebrate the Passover. And there's a couple of things that are wrapped up in there that I just want to touch on. Number one is that deliverance of the Lord comes quick. And when you get an opportunity to get out of a mess, move quick. And so the, the, the deliverance of God is it, so beautiful that God's judgment had to come, but yet God's mercy came with it. That God's mercy came upon the Israelites. That God had already thought ahead of how to provide mercy for them. And, and God loves to show mercy to his children. He loves to show mercy to his kids. And he made a way out. And he, but it wasn't just enough to put the blood. He wanted to teach them a lesson. That deliverance comes, it comes quick. And that night, that night when they ate the meal, that's when deliverance came. That's when they got out. And that's why he said, whenever you eat this meal, do it at sunset. At the same time of day that I brought deliverance for my, for my people. And there's also another thing that I wanted to bring up in this, and that is, I, you know, I've heard somebody talk about the story of Jonah and how Jonah, the, 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 the big storm hit the boat that Jonah was in, and the, they started praying to all these gods saying, why, why is judgment come upon this boat? And they got down to Jonah, and they figured out that that storm was aimed at Jonah. So they threw Jonah overboard, and the storm stopped upon the boat. And the Lord spoke to me and said, not every storm that hits your boat is aimed at you. It may be aimed at somebody you've let get in your boat. So you got to be careful who you let get in your boat. You may be dealing with storms in your life that aren't aimed at you. They're aimed at somebody in your family. They're aimed at one of your friends. They're aimed at your business partner. They're aimed at somebody else. So we got to be very careful that we don't put uh, somebody else's storm in our boat. But this is, this is the, God wanted to remind his people every year of what they'd been delivered of. I wonder what it'd be like if we stood up once a year, all of us, and gave our testimony and reminded ourselves afresh of what we've been brought out of. Because some of us have been saved a long time, and some of us have forgot just how bad a sinner we were, just how far from God we were, just how much he found us, we didn't find him. And so the very first thing they were to celebrate every year was to celebrate the Passover or celebrate their deliverance. Yes, I love technology. All right, let me see where I'm at. My remote dropped out for a second. Give our internet just a sec, catch up. All right, so celebrate the Feast of Weeks. Number two is celebrate the Feast of Weeks. Now, what is the, fe the Feast of Weeks? Well, the Feast of Weeks is, it would change every year because it depended upon the harvest. So and it's interesting that the sons of Issachar were part of uh, knowing the times in which they live. They were also astrologers and they would know when to plant, when to harvest and all those kind of things. And so the second feast was the Feast of Weeks. And, and it was when uh, the very first time you put the sickle to the wheat, the very first time you would count, that would start the first day. And then you would count forward 49 days and you would get to that 49th day and you would have a, a festival for a week at the end of that to celebrate the harvest that God had given you. you. You would mark that day and then God says, now watch the harvest come in. You would go through the whole harvest, 49 days of harvesting before you had to give your offering back to God. 
And this festival of weeks, it was their way of celebrating the harvest. And I'm put up here, God's provision for our lives. It's important that we are able to celebrate God's provision and remind ourselves because God has bigger dreams for you than what you've already accomplished. And those dreams may take more resources than you've ever had before. But if you found God faithful with a dime, faithful with a dollar, faithful with a 10, you can call, find him faithful with a hundred and a thousand and a 10,000 and a hundred thousand and a million and a two million. God is faithful to do that. And I want to encourage us um, that, that he built in once a year for them to recognize the provision that God had brought upon our lives. The other thing that's interesting is from the very first Passover, the Israelites tra traveled for 49 days to Mount Horeb. So they had the Passover. Then for 49 days, they went to Mount Horeb. And then on Mount Horeb is when Moses went up the mountain and he received uh, the, the, the uh, Ten Commandments. So we, we see that, that, that Feast of Weeks right in there. It wasn't a natural harvest, but it was a time frame from the Passover that got us to, to the covenant with God, the Ten Commandments. Also, Jesus uh, was crucified during the Passover. Everybody from all over the world had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And they just didn't know that Jesus Jesus was the Passover lamb. So during the Passover is when Jesus uh, was crucified. And then it says that, that Jesus rose from the dead three days later, and then he taught his disciples for about 40 days. And then on that 49th day that finished the, the Feast of Weeks, the next day was Pentecost. So actually the Feast of Weeks celebrates Pentecost. And Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit was given out and the first major harvest of humans, the, fair, the first major harvest of salvations with 3,000 people getting saved in one day and, and people being added to the church. We see that happening here at the conclusion of the celebrated Feast of Weeks. And so the Feast of Weeks also is linked to Pentecost because we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the things that's beautiful is, 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 is they, they, all they had to do is cut into the harvest and just start the clock. That's all they had to do. Then enjoy bringing in the harvest. And then at the end, now look at what God has done and how he has provided for us. And then celebrate by giving unto God. And so, and then, and, and it's, of course, as we do that in the natural, what does God do? He pours out his Holy Spirit and, and all these people get saved. And the first fruit of the major harvest of the major revivals happens in Jerusalem on Pentecost. Number three is the celebration of the Feast of Booths. So on the Feast of Booths, um, the, it is a celebration that God told them he wanted them to do. And this is where we celebrate our journey, not just our arrival, but our journey along the way. Don't you know journeys are messy? Journeys, uh, some are very productive and some are, you have to take some side trips and you have to take potty breaks and do stuff like that. Well, to celebrate the Feast of Booths is this. God said one week a year, I want you to move out of your house built of rock and built of wood and all that. I want you to move out of your permanent house and live in a tent. Live in a tent for a week. And I want you to remind yourself that for 40 years, God had brought you out of Egypt. You lived in temporary shelter that you could break down, that you could travel with the tabernacle when the pillar fire cloud would go up and move. The Levites would tear down the tabernacle, pick it up and carry it. All the people would tear down their tents, tear down their temporary movable stuff. They would pack it up and they would move with the pillar cloud and fire. For 40 years, they moved around the desert living in a temporary shelter. And God said one week a year. I want you to move out of your houses, the, your, your permanent shelters that you have built. I want you to move in the tent. God must love camping. Uh, you know, move in your tent. And I want you to remind yourself uh, of, of what that I provided for you before you had these houses you did not build. I provided for you. Before you uh, made these clothes out of the fabrics and out of the stuff I gave you in Canaan, I made sure your shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. Before you lived off these crops you did not plant, I made manna come down from heaven. I want to remind you of what I did for you when you couldn't take care of yourself. There are times when we become so self-sufficient as Christians we know the Bible. We know the rules. We're, we've become successful in some manners. We don't need a miracle anymore. Life is good, at least manageable. At least we can handle it. 
And sometimes God says, I want you to get out of your rut of living in the American dream, of not needing to act for, operate by faith, not needing a miracle. And I want you to go live in a tent for a week and remind yourself of how I provided for you when you couldn't provide for yourself. Remind yourself of the journey you took to get here and how, how big a part I played in providing for you. Yes, you have a house now. Yes, you have crops. Yes, you have servants. It wasn't so back in the desert, and I still loved you, and I still cared for you. I don't love you because of what you produce for me. I don't love you because of how successful you are. I loved you when you had nothing else to offer me and you needed my help. I love you for who you are, not for what you can contribute back to me. And number four, the last thing, <clears throat> I want to celebrate NCC. I want to take just a minute and talk about New Covenant Church. This is, uh, we sell it, the first Sunday of November is usually when we celebrate uh, our, our birthday, our anniversary. Today we're doing that a little bit differently because of, you know, 2020. So we're celebrating today the 43rd anniversary. The first Sunday of 1977, Frank and Shirley Harvey gathered 43 people from across the denominational lines who were interested in the Holy Spirit the gifts of God that, that we see in Acts chapter 2. They gather together in, in, in the Henry house, in, in the basement, and they began a church that day that was spirit-filled, that believed in the gifts of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and wanted to pursue as much God as they possibly could, even if it got outside of the normal bounds. And that day, New Covenant Church was founded uh, we were there for just a little while, and then we, we rented the, uh, the old cleaners building. That place was like crazy. It had two different colors of carpet. Like, like I think it had green and brown carpet. I think the green was shag carpet. The brown was like the short peel, so it was, you could putt off the brown carpet. But the green, you, you had to almost mow it every week. Um, we had overhead projectors and stuff on the wall for the screens and stuff. We had coffee, tea, and cookies in the back every service. So homeless people, people were hungry. They would just they would come in, hang out in the back. We had we had we were right off the main road. We were one block off Main Street. So we had Venetia blinds, and we would pull them things up. We, we would open, half the time the heat and air conditioning didn't work. We'd open have to open up the doors, and we had tambourines, and we had banners, and we had dance. We had all kinds of stuff. So people would pull up at the red light outside like three or four cars down from the red light and could just sit there and watch us go crazy in there we were like the first church in this community that had banners and tambourines and dancers and and, and speaking in tongues and I, it, it, it back in the day it was something it was it was we have stories and stories and stories about those days hey what's interesting though is we had a food pantry even back then, we had a heart for taking care of the poor and the hurting in our community. People would come in and get a, get a cookie and get some, uh, some coffee, and we'd load them up back groceries and send them back out. And our church began to grow during that season. And then we moved on to the old Nazarene church. The Nazarene church wanted to sell their building in Hazelwood, and we ended up buying it. And again, our air, we didn't have air conditioning. We had big ceiling fans, and so we'd have to open up the windows. I guess that was our evangelism kind of style is just go crazy pursuing God on the inside, but leave the windows open so people can watch and people can hear. And sure enough, we won some of our neighbors to the Lord and they joined the church. And we were there for, for many years. And, and, um, and then I think it was 1990s when we built this building right here and, um, and have been here ever since and have added balconies and added in other buildings and stuff like that. But New Covenant has definitely grown over the years and God has been good to us. And there's a couple of things that I just wanted to mention. Uh, number one is the spirit-filled. We were intentional about being a spirit-filled church, believing that all the gifts of God, all the offices of God are still available today and that, that God does still get outside the box and mess up our schedules. And he loves to do things that, that, that we shake our head and say, only God. Uh, but we are a very spirit-filled church. We're big in worship. And uh, we, back in the, in the, um, at the Nazarene church, we would go to these Tabernacle of David conferences about, about worship and de uh, demonstrative worship, lifting of our hands, singing new songs, uh, creative arts, you know, having banners or mime or dramas and using different ways to express God's beauty and creativity, his grandeur and his glory. 
So worship's always been a big part. In fact, we be, of our services, we believe worship's even more important than preaching. We believe if we can get you into worship in the presence of Almighty God and you and to him have an exchange, it is more important than what I've got to say. You can read the Bible for yourself. You can turn on preachers. But if I can bring you into the presence of the Lord and you can connect with him, that's the most important thing we can do. Uh, it wasn't long after our church began that inner healing became a big deal, that we want to be as emotionally healthy as we are spiritually healthy, that God wants us to take care of the whole man. And so inner healing's always been a big part of our church. We're always trying to help people unpack the stuff they've, that they've picked up along the journey. And uh, so those are some things about New Covenant that are unique to, to, to us. I want to take just a minute and, um, wow, I bolded something that's hard to read. I literally can't be it. Can't even read that. That's okay. So I want to take just a minute. And I, we've had a brilliant past. And we've had one of the things, privileges that I get, this is what it was. One of the privileges I have is whenever we have a wedding or we have a funeral, we have people from our past that come back. People who used to be part of New Covenant Church. Maybe they moved away. Maybe they go to another church now. Whatever. And being here for so long, I get the privilege of when they come in for the funeral or they come in for the wedding is for me to go up to them and say thank you. There's a generation that's here at New Covenant today that doesn't know the sacrifices you made. They don't remember the building fund when we moved into this building. They don't remember when we had to pave the parking lot. They don't, they don't know all the things that, all the generations, all the contributions of previous generation made. So if you're one of those people that are no longer living in Clyde, North Carolina, and you're watching today, because I know we got some folks in Louisiana, we got some folk, folks in Colorado, we got some folks in Florida, all over the place that were here physically and now watch us online. I want you to know we still think about you. We still talk about you. We appreciate you. And sincerely, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for the sacrifices that you made that allow us to be here today and be the church that we are today. Second of all, I want to look to our future for a second. Our future is bright. If God has provided me with this, this incredible job opportunity that I have, I mean, Working in the community with other pastors, pulling churches together to do gaudy displays of God's love for the hurting in our community, that's me all day long. I, I look forward, if that's what God has for me, I was talking to Brian Cagle recently and I said, Brian, I said, you know, if I make this transition, you know, we're gonna have to go find the right person. He said, we should find somebody way better than Nick Harnerkamp, way better. And I'm like, I agree, I, I, I totally agree. I want the very best for this house. I know this. I've left this house stocked full of good elders, stocked full of a great staff, stocked full of great preachers. I am confident that we can make this transition and make it well, and we are better set up to do it now than we've ever been set up before. We've only grown through this COVID-19. Our finances have done well through this COVID-19. Our leadership in the community and serving the poor and missions, we haven't missed a beat. We've grown, we've increased. If there's ever been a time we can make this transition, I want to go out on top and we're on the top right now. So our future is bright. The last thing I told you, I want to do something special at the end of the sermon. I've never prayed this prayer before. So stay with me for just a second. If you've been, if you've been around me in the last year or two, you know, and I've led our church to this twice. You know that when I go and spend time with the Lord in prayer, he'll ask me to cleanse my bloodlines and I'll repent of sins in each of my different bloodlines. And then what I do is I say, Papa, now that we've cleaned out this bloodline, I'm positive of this. I'm positive that there were people in my bloodline that missed their assignment, that forfeited their assignment, that did not accomplish what they were called to do. And, and so whether they neglected it, didn't want it, didn't see the value in it for whatever reason. There is favor and influence and resources and stuff that's been lost in my generational line. But you intended for us to do and accomplish what you called us to. Is there not a Hunter camp alive that's calling on heaven to give back the seed that's been, so, that's been stolen by the devil, whether that's resources, relationships, revelation, favor, grace, whatever those things are, I'm asking, I've repenting of those sins, and I'm asking you to fulfill your destiny through my bloodline by letting the current day honor camps accomplish what the previous honor camps did not accomplish. And I believe that God listens from heaven and then begins to release those things that were bypassed by our predecessors, and he wants to release them right now upon my bloodline. And if that's true, I know that New Covenant Church 
over the years has missed opportunities. They've made the wrong decision. They've lost an opportunity to do what God's called them to do. If you're part of the current day New Covenant Church family, I'm getting ready to pray that anything that was ever stolen from this house, any assignment that didn't get accomplished, any resource that was fumbled or lost or misplaced or mistreated, I'm going to play, pray that God restore all of that over the last 43 years upon this current day New Covenant family and that we will finish what we were called to do and that you will increase in favor, you will increase in resources, you will increase in faith. So I'm getting ready to pray that over you right now. Why should it be lost? Why should it be gone? God's the master of restoration, of redemption. He's the master of resurrection. I believe right now there's a transfer getting ready to happen in the heavenlies on those people who are here today and on the camera who call themselves new covenant people who are willing to receive that. If you're willing to receive that, I'm asking you to position yourself before the Lord and let me pray down those blessings on your life. Papa, right now, I recognize that there were many missed assignments over 43 years. There were many resources that we mishandled or lost. There were many faith opportunities we didn't take. There were people that weren't managed well. There were assignments that weren't managed well. There were things we didn't value at the time. And we have fumbled some of our destiny along the way. But Papa, you are a God, you are a mega who finishes what Alpha begins. Uh, even when we fumble the ball, it doesn't mean you can't restore it. And so right now, Father, as senior pastor of this house, I'm recognizing that, that we have stumbled and fumbled and dropped some things along the way. But our heart's desire is to finish what you have caused us to do, not just this year, but in the next season ahead. That we want to give you your glory by completing our assignment and being everything to you and to this world we were created to be. So, Papa, I'm asking you for any anointing, any assignments, any authority, any favor, any revelation, relationships, any grace out there that we have lost. I'm asking you to restore it to this this present generation of new covenant people, that you'd open the windows of heaven upon this house and you would give us the honor and the privilege of giving back to you what you deserve. Our obedience, our humility, and your glory. And I'm asking that upon this house right now in Jesus' name, amen. I bless you guys in Jesus' name. I bless you with God's favor on your life. I thank you for uh, uh, your faithfulness, your goodness uh, uh, to this house, but also to me. Happy birthday, New Covenant Church. Who would have ever thought 43 years later we'd be standing here? Uh, I bless you guys with, with the ability to see fresh. See, here's the thing. All that stuff's been floating around us. We just didn't know how to mobilize and how to see it, how to activate it. I bless you right now with fresh eyes of the spirit and of faith to be able to lean in and to be able to take hold of the good things that God has for you. I bless you with that in Jesus' name. Hey, guys, I'm going to get ready to turn it over. I want to say to you, if, uh, if you have a prayer request, go to newcovenantchurch.com, click on that connect button. If you'd like somebody to call you and, and pray with you, please go on that uh, connect button and just give us your phone number. Somebody will call you in the next 24 hours. I love you. I bless you. God bless you. See you guys soon.